Nothing. Thank you, Joel. I don't know about many of you, but when Joel or whoever's playing Prelude like that, so many of those songs I grew up with, I've heard them since before I could sing them, and the words start going through my mind. And one of the last ones that Joel played was, He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand. And in the verse, just to quickly paraphrase, it doesn't matter how bad it gets. Around me, for me, how much it affects me, he still leads. Amen. Okay. I would suggest that some of you might reach out and poke or otherwise disturb the person next to you and make sure we're all awake this morning. We are here to worship our God to praise our Savior, the one who died in my place, paid the debt that I owe that I couldn't begin to make a dent in. So let's stand this morning and sing and do just that. standing for prayer. Amen. Let's Amen. pray. Our Father, thank you for this glorious day. Not only is the weather nice, but that's not what I'm talking about. I thank you for what this day represents. The day when Jesus rose from the dead, and we're grateful that we, on the first day of this brand new week, we can begin our week as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, focused, centered, encouraging the body of Christ and worshiping together, studying together. And we pray and ask for your blessing in your church. Help us today, Lord. Do your will and your work in our lives and in, in our midst today, we ask. And we ask these things 
because of Jesus and in his name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you here this morning. We're thankful that you've joined us as we worship together. We're thankful for those on live stream as well. If you have never been here in person and you're tuning in live stream, we'd love to meet you here in person, face to face. And if this is your first time here in person at McCoy, we do thank you for being here in the pew. Should be a welcome card or a guest card. If you could fill that out, we want to know you by name. And then as you leave in the foyer, there are two bistro tables with offering plates. You could leave that card there so we can know you by name and know that you're here. I've got a couple announcements this morning. The first is <clears throat> Ladies Retreat, September 24th and 26th. Men and women, mark it on your calendars. Men, not because you're going, but because you're going to take the kiddos, right? And ladies, put it on your calendar. This is just such a blessing. Uh, I know my wife has been blessed by this for so many years. Every time she goes, I would encourage you men, you will be blessed by sending and encouraging your wives to go. And women, go. It is worth it. I just want to encourage you, Meredith Barrett, that's one of our missionaries, uh, will be here. She'll be speaking, of whom shall I be afraid? Uh, um, should we fear man or God? It will be a great weekend. And then we actually have the Barretts the following weekend, is that right? So it'll be good to have them. Uh, i got to keep moving. I focus on one too long. Church picnic, August 29th. Put it on your calendars after Sunday school. We'll all go to Bonneville Park. We'll talk more about that. But put it on your calendars. You won't want to miss it. Also, fundamentals of biblical counseling. That might sound, you know, big or intense. This is a training that Michiana Biblical Counseling offers. It, uh, this is three weekends. It's Friday and Saturday. There's a weekend in September, one in October, one in November. It's 30 hours of training, uh, but don't be intimidated. This is a tremendous blessing, an opportunity for you to understand and maybe grow in your ability to take God's word and encourage others, not necessarily in a formal counseling setting, even though you could, but even day to day, you go have a cup of coffee with someone. How can I encourage them from God's word? You'll want to check this out. There's uh, brochures back there. It is well worth the investment of time. Also want to mention, I think that's actually it. <laughs> Pastor is going to come up next. That's what I want to mention. Don't intrude in my space. Okay. All right. Uh, I... Saturday night, August 21st, coming up here shortly. We have a group coming. It's three people called One Lev, One Heart. In Hebrew, Lev means the heart. So One Lev, One Heart. They are from the country of Israel. Actually, uh, one is from Russia, one is from, I forget, and one is from Elkhart, Indiana. Okay? So um, we're trusting that there might be other ministries, other churches that send some people over. But here's a little flavor, uh, just a little flavor of the music about a uh, minute long. One day he will come, he will come, return to us to Jerusalem. He will come and bring us peace, will bring us peace. Lori, who's the person from Elkhart, has been serving as a missionary in Israel for 20 years now. And um, so they're back, and she's with her group, so they're going to come. And this is the only time they had for us, so that'll be fun. Saturday night, it'll be a blessing. A love offering will be collected. Now this is August 1st. Can you believe it? And we have a missionary of the month we want to focus on, and that is Paul and Kim Halsey and one of our... Uh, Ken Peterson from our missions committee is going to share, and the Halseys will be with us at the end of the month. They'll be in the Elkhart area. Paul and Kim Halsey served the Lord under crossword, 
across world missions at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Paul grew up in Elkhart, graduating from Elkhart Central before attending Liberty University. After marrying Kim, they served the Lord in the Philippines for 14 years. Paul and Kim now represent Crossworld on the Liberty University campus as mobilizers for global missions, ministering to students around the ministering to students on campus, seeking out, encouraging, and mentoring those whom God is leading into missions around the world. As part of this ministry, Paul helps to coordinate short-term mission trips. In addition to the Liberty University campus, their ministry involves local churches and communicating with individuals who have expressed interest in missions after seeing the Crossworld website. They also serve in the missions program, program in their local church, Heritage Baptist. Paul and Kim celebrated their 40th anniversary earlier this year. God has blessed them with three children, including Katie, who is married to Pastor Ray and Nancy's son, John, and 10 grandchildren. I think there are three short in this picture. Praises from the Halsey's. Praise that Kim's chronic facial pain related to Lyme's disease is currently better with only occasional pain. Praise that there has been a lot of contact via our website with people who have skills to fit in overseas places where traditional missionaries are not welcome. Praise that a number of ministry workers have volunteered to serve and are at various stages of preparation for going out into the harvest field. Prayer requests from the Halseys. Pray for four individuals or couples who have accepted God's call, however, however, for various reasons, are waiting for an open door to go. Pray for four other individuals or couples who are raising support to go. This final request from Paul should be a prayer request from each of us. Please pray that God will continually stir my heart to remember and stay focused on the 2.9 billion people around the world with little or no access to the glorious gospel message of grace, hope, and freedom in Christ. Thank you. Let's pray for Paul and Kim. Bow with me in prayer. Our Father, we want to thank you that for many years we have had the privilege, the honor of standing behind Paul and Kim as they served in the Philippines church planning. Then they were called by the mission to locate at Liberty University to mentor and guide those young people, those students that sense a call from you to the various mission fields of the world and how they have faithfully mentored them and taken them through the various steps to get to being a career missionary. We pray for the eight couples that were mentioned, four and four, and we pray, Lord, that those who are on pause now and others who are seeking to raise their support, you know who those eight couples are, and we pray that their raising of their support or whatever hindrances are keeping them from getting to the field, that those would be cleared away and they would be able to go. And Lord, help us to remember as a local church that you gave your great commission and it is our responsibility, that's right, ours, to participate in the global evangelism and the planting of local churches around the world that is the Great Commission, and that is our responsibility. And help us not to forget the 2.9 billion people that have, do not have any access at all to hear the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that we would be involved in that in, ever in an increasing way. And we pray that from our own congregation, you would call those in a very definite way and that they will sense that and be willing to say that here am I, Lord, send me or us. We ask this now in Jesus' most precious name, amen. Let's stand again. We are here only because of Jesus. the part 
to save the dead who can save us from our sin he is our hope our righteousness jesus only jesus who can make the blind to see psalmist writes, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. 
I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness hides the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me, yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Who shall I fear? I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind. is always by my 
side. The writer of Hebrews tells us, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd, sure the price it has been paid for jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overcome the grave to this i hold my sin has been defeated jesus For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory. Still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, in 
me when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me yet not i but through christ in me yet not i but through christ in me oh lord jesus we are so thankful to you this morning that we don't have to do this in our own strength as the apostle paul wrote in my weakness his strength your strength is made perfect And as we sing this song this morning, we're, as we think about all that you've done for us, all that you are doing day after day after day on our behalf, we thank you, we praise you, we crown you our King, our Savior, our Shepherd. We trust our lives to you this morning, and we pray that each and every day, we would look to you for that strength so that when everything is all said and done, we can stand up, give all the glory to you, and say it was only through Christ in me. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. To Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. I want to begin this message this morning with a quote from Dr. David Jeremiah, and I think it is insightful and it really is a great introduction to what I want to say from Daniel chapter 11. Here it is. When I first began to preach the Bible, in full-time ministry, I never shied away from the prophetic portions. I gave them equal time and emphasis as part of the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, 27. But I do have a secret confession to make. Forty years ago, and this comes from a book published in 2008, Forty years ago, I could not imagine how one individual could rise to such a place of prominence and power as the Bible ascribes to the coming Antichrist. We didn't think of the world as a global village at that time in history. But today the world is shrinking. We are connected by money, media, missiles, and materials as never before. Today, <clears throat> the idea of a one world ruler seems totally plausible and becomes more so every day. And that is true. That is so true. Well, folks, listen. The crisis events of that are characteristic of the end times, the crisis events that are characteristic of the end times, not the least of which will be the instantaneous disappearance of hundreds of millions of Christians from around the world at the rapture of the church. This event and others will create an environment ripe for a charismatic individual to step forward and lead the world to a place of momentary stability. Momentary. And that man will be the Antichrist, Satan's Superman. Instead of saving the world, he will lead it to the final battle of history, the Battle of Armageddon, where he and his forces will be defeated 
by the returning King of Kings, Jesus Christ. But prior to that time, he will demonstrate superhuman, supernatural powers such as the world has never seen except for Jesus Christ when he was here. Now, based on the number 666, okay, based on that number in Revelation 13, verse 18, many attempts have been made in history to identify who the Antichrist is or will be using a system of numerology where letters of the alphabet are assigned numerical values, attempts have been made to find the names of historical figures, the letters of whose names add up to 666. And surprisingly, many names have qualified mathematically. The only problem is that none have turned out to be the Antichrist. The Bible does not tell us who the Antichrist will be. His name, his nationality, or any other specifics. In fact, folks, the Apostle Paul informed the church that this coming world ruler, or this leader, will not be revealed until after the rapture of the church. Makes that very clear. The Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, here's what the Apostle Paul said to that church and to our church. And now you know what is holding him back. And in the context there, verses 1 through 5, he's talking about the man of lawlessness, or another name for him, the beast, or another name for him, the Antichrist. You know what's holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And I believe that is the Holy Spirit who indwells his church who is on this earth. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. It is the presence of the church of Jesus Christ that is even though lawlessness is at work in our world, it is the presence of the church of Jesus Christ and what the Lord is doing that is holding it all back to some level, to some degree. But when the church is caught up, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, there's going to be a vacuum. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Then he'll be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Well, let's now turn our attention to Daniel chapter 11. What's this got to do with all this? Well, The final three chapters, the final three chapters of Daniel, chapters 10, 11, and 12, contain Daniel's fourth and last vision. Chapter 10 is the introduction to this vision. The actual message or revelation brought by the angel is found in chapters 11 and 12. And the length of chapter 10, as we've observed before, the length of chapter 10, the introduction, and what is presented there, the mourning and fasting for 21 days, what Daniel saw and experienced, um, the warfare among good and evil angels in the heavenlies, all of that is sufficient to alert the reader that a tremendous message, a tremendous revelation is about to be delivered. And it concerns a great war. Did you notice that? A great conflict. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message, a revelation was given to Daniel. Its message was true, and it was about, it concerned a great war, a great conflict. 
A big war, as the message says. All of this is leading to this, to that. And what's going to occur at that time? That's what this message is about. Also look at verse 14, chapter 10. Now I have come, the angel says to Daniel, I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people, your people, Daniel, in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. A time yet to come. Now, in this vision or this message that's going to be given, chapter, beginning in chapter 11, verse 2, there are two parts. And I've, I've drawn attention to these. First of all, last week, we looked at chapter 11, verses 2 to 35. And this concerns the near or the immediate future, relatively speaking, from the third year of Cyrus, 536 B.C., to the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes, 175 to 164. So 372 years. And the whole passage moves to this Syrian king. 42%, or maybe it was 40, yeah, 42% of verses 2 through verse 35 are devoted to his reign and the things he did to Jerusalem, to the Jewish temple, to the Jewish people, and Antiochus was the same guy who was the main subject of Daniel's vision, his second vision in chapter 8. He was the main subject there, too. And why? Because Antiochus Epiphanes is the prototype of the future world leader to come called the Antichrist. Now, you're going to have to follow me here. I'm going to give a quote from John Walvoord. The amazingly detailed prophecies of the first 35 verses of this chapter, containing as they do approximately 135 prophetic statements, all now fulfilled, constitute an impressive introduction to the events that are yet future, beginning in verse 36. So look at verse 36. You see, at verse 36, well, that's uh, chapter 11 last week, beginning at verse 36 through chapter 12, verse 3, that concerns the far, the distant future. It concerns the far, the distant future, the time of the end, the time just before and at the second coming of Christ. So far, that means, you know what that means? So far, between verse 35 and verse 36, as of right now, that means that nearly 2,200 years have intervened between verses 35 and 36. But events beginning at verse 36 are focused. Remember, they're focused on the 70th week of Daniel. That is the focus of verses 36 through chapter 12, verse 3. At verse 36, the prophecy shifts from Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes to the man he foreshadowed, the man of which he was the prototype, the Antichrist, the final world ruler, and this ruler makes Antiochus Epiphanes look like a Boy Scout. Now, we may not know who this world ruler will be, but we do know what he will be. We do know what he will be. Now, our text this morning is actually Daniel 11, verse 36 to 39. However, I would like to read the word of God and not only read that, but also read verses 40 to 45 which has to do with the final battle, the battle of Armageddon. Even though it's not called that here, it is in the book of Revelation. And then chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, which, which deal with the great tribulation, the coming of Christ, and what's going to happen to the Jewish people, salvation, deliverance, and resurrection, the first resurrection. So with your Bible opened, I want to take the time and please stand with me as we read the word of God. Stand with me as we read the word of God. 
The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desired or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his fathers. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. Before I read verse 40, things are going to start falling apart for him. The battle of Armageddon is not just one single battle. Verse 40, at the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle. And the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries, that is the Antichrist. He will, in response, he will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land, that is Israel. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and Nubians in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. That's Mount Zion, that's Jerusalem. Yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, our text this morning is those first verses 36 through 39, but I'm also going to draw on Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus' teaching, of the Olivet Discourse, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 13, Paul's letter, and Revelation chapter 13. We'll be drawing on those passages. Isn't it wonderful that we have the completed word of God? That's right. And we're to compare scripture with scripture. Two things I want to draw your attention to about the one who will rule the world. First of all, well, that was when we were supposed to be reading his profile, the profile of the coming world ruler. First of all, he will be a charismatic leader. That doesn't mean he'll be an evangelical who speaks in tongues. Okay, but it means he'll be a dynamic type personality. He will be a charismatic leader. Three times in Daniel chapter 7, we're told about this man's mouth, whoever it's going to be. He speaks boastful words, defiant words, great blasphemies. He's got a big mouth. In Revelation 13, 5, we're told that he was given a mouth to utter great, proud words and blasphemies. He will be one of the most powerful orators the world has ever known, and he will use that skill 
to sway masses of people in the direction he wants them to go. Here's a description written by Charles Colson, who's now with the Lord, but written by Charles Colson of a similar power possessed by Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler. Colson says this, solemn symphonic music began the setup. The music then stopped, a hush prevailed, and a patriotic anthem began. And from the back, walking slowly down the wide center aisle, strutted Hitler. Finally, the Fuhrer himself rises to speak, beginning in a low velvet voice which makes the audience unconsciously lean forward to hear. He begins to speak of his love for Germany, and gradually his pitch increases and increases until he reaches a screaming crescendo. But his audience does not mind because they are all standing on their feet and screaming with him. Anyone who has ever seen a documentary, fil documentary film footage of Hitler speaking in those pre-World War II rallies in Germany knows the scene and has experienced somewhat of the chill, the chill of fear almost, in watching a human being exercise that kind of power over people. And whereas Hitler had the power to captivate a nation, the Antichrist will have power to captivate the whole world. He will be a charismatic person, leader. He will be a cunning leader. <coughs> in fact, chapter 8 says, talks about him being a stern-faced king. A master of intrigue will arise, it says. A master of intrigue. He'll be a cunning individual. Look at Je Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Now, one of the ways you can understand that very clearly is substitute, substitute the word king or kings every time you see horn, because that's, that's, that's the interpretation given later. So let's read it again. Well, I was thinking about the kings, the ten of them, okay? There before me was another king, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first kings were uprooted before it. This king had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. In other words, he, de he deposes, he begins, he's a little one coming up, from this European coalition of ten nations, a revived, from God's perspective, Roman Empire. And from among them begins little, but he rises up and he brings down three. He deposes three kings as he claws his way to power in that part of the world until he ultimately controls the whole Western world. Not only that, but he will be a cultic leader. And that's where verses 30, 36 through 39 come in right here. One of the things he will do, it says, is he will de deify himself. Look at verse 36. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. The apostle Paul wrote in, in 2, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Also in Revelation 13, but we don't have time. He will not only defy himself, he will defy the true God. It says here, in the second part of verse 36, he will say unheard of things. Things that have never been spoken before. Shocking, astonishing to those who hear them.
And the same was said of him as the little horn in Daniel 7.25 and as the beast of Revelation 13. The same types of things. Thirdly, he will disregard all other religions. He's, this man is an atheist. He will disregard. It says in verse 37 of Daniel chapter 11, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers. In other words, he'll show total disregard for the gods that his family, his relatives, his ancestors worshipped. It also says next, that he will, nor will he regard, I'm sorry, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women. A reasonable explanation, considering Daniel's Jewish background, is the natural desire of godly Jewish women in the Old Testament to become the mother of the promised Messiah, the seed of the woman, from Genesis 3.15. So, not only will the Antichrist show, show no regard for the God of his fathers, their religion, or any religion, he will oppose the Jewish religion in particular. In particular. Finally, verse 37 says, nor will he regard, notice it now, he will, nor will he regard any God but will exalt himself over them all. The Antichrist will be an atheist and reject all religions except the one he establishes, the religion of emperor worship. He will deify himself in this revived Roman Empire. His devotion will be to his military war machine. He will have a God. Look at verse 37. Instead of them, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God unknown to his fathers he will honor, and he'll pour lots of money, gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He's going to fund this war machine. He's going to build it up, and he's got a nation, ten nations in this coalition that are going to do it very powerful, and lots of money are going to be given and devoted to this God. And not only that, but he's going to reward those <coughs> who uh, participate in that. Look what it says. Um, yeah, verse 39, he will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign God and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He'll honor them. He will make them rulers over many peoples. In other words, you'll get positions and will distribute land at a price. You know what the price is? You've got to sell your soul. Sell your soul in total devotion to this man who claims to be God and to his program. Not only that, but he will be a cultic leader. He will be a cruel leader. Daniel 7.25 says he speaks against the Most High and op will oppress his saints. The saints, it says, will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. He will spare no one in his quest for world domination. He will persecute those who seek to follow Christ during the tribulation, and many will be martyred for their faith. If you want to know that, go to Revelation 7, where there's a host of people from every tribe, tongue, people, nation, and language. And the question is, who are these? These are they who have come out of the great tribulation and have made their robes white. Jews will particularly be in the crosshairs for persecution and murder. That's why Jesus said, in Matthew 24, what will be the sign of your coming? He says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, then if you're in Jerusalem, get out. Flee to places of refuge and safety because there will be great tribulation such as has never occurred in the past or ever again. 
And unless those days are limited, no flesh would survive. And then lastly, he's going to do as he pleases. He's going to do as he pleases. Verse 36 says, he will be an absolute dictator who will demand that he have his own way. He will tolerate no restraint upon himself. He will recognize no a law or authority higher than himself. In fact, it says he will change laws in times. The Apostle Paul recognized this character trait of the Antichrist by calling him the man of lawlessness. He's a law to himself. He will do as he pleases. Next thing I want to touch on is his program. We're going to have to go through this rather quickly, but his program, the program of the coming world ruler. Now, I want to put a scripture up from Revelation chapter 13, <coughs> verses 1 to 3, where the apostle John in, this, in the Revelation says, the, re the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. The dragon is Satan. The sea is the mass of humanity. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns. That takes you back to Daniel 7 and Daniel 2. And seven heads. With ten crowns on his horns. These are kings. These are kingdoms. And on each head was a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. That takes you back to Daniel chapter 7. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne in great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a, had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished. What were they astonished at? The fatal wound that had now been healed and followed the beast. What about his program? Well, the world is going to be looking for someone who's going to be able to bring peace and stability to the Middle East. It's already a mess right now. Remember that the majority of the world's petroleum reserves are there. Also remember that the ongoing tension between Israel and her neighbors, who's now a nation, and her neighbors around her. The Antichrist will come on the scene to be the Savior. And the Bible tells us that he is going to make a treaty, a covenant. That is going to begin the 70th week of Daniel. He's going to make them a covenant with them. Most likely promising protection and the military might of his coalition of nations, Western nations, to protect and give them security. He's going to make a covenant with them on behalf of the nations. And for three and one half years, the first three and a half years, there will be peace in the Middle East. And during that time, another thing he's going to allow them do, to do is build their temple. Do you know Hasidic Jews today in Israel? They have all the plans ready. Everything is ready to rebuild the temple. It's all in place. And that is a fact. Priests, utensils, all full architectural plans just waiting for the time. And he's going to make a treaty until he breaks that treaty in the middle of the week and begins to persecute Israel and many others as well. At some point around that time, he is going to be assassinated. And I believe someone's going to put a bullet through his head. He's going to be assassinated. And, but by the power of Satan, he's going to come back to life in a veiled counterfeit of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus is the Christ, right? This guy is the what? Antichrist. The prophecy reminds me of the day President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. 
1963. Is that correct? Did I get that right? Okay. Can you imagine what the world would have thought if, in just a matter of hours, he had risen from the dead and began to speak? Imagine the reaction on the world stage when the Antichrist does just that. It says that the whole world will be astonished. And whether his death and resurrection is feigned or real, okay, whether it's fake or whether it's real, the world will throw their support to this one, as powerful as he is, and his lieutenant, the biblical false prophet, that's a whole another individual, his PR man, his lieutenant, that person is going to establish a form of registration that causes everyone to receive a mark. And those who receive the mark will be able to buy and sell and do business, while those who do not receive it and get along with the program will suffer terribly. That mark is going to be your passport to live in this world. Either you get with the program or you suffer greatly. The Antichrist will set himself up as one to be worshipped in the temple of the Jews in Jerusalem. He will, he will set up an image of himself, the false prophet will. And this image is going to be able to talk and do strange things, miraculous things. He's going to set himself up, and all the world will be required to acknowledge. It's called the abomination that brings desolation. Now, his time is going to be very short, only three and a half years, very short, 42 months. Uh, you know, different times are given, a time, times, and half a time, 1,260 days. They all add up to the same thing. In fact, Jesus said, if those days are not limited, what? No flesh would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be limited. His time will be very short. And lots of things are going to happen at that time. Now, I was going to... I want to end just briefly here by giving some essential applications, I think. And I'd like to ask you to turn with me to 2 Peter. Let's go to 2 Peter. <clears throat> Chapter 3. Peter begins where I want to begin right here in first, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, with a warning, a warning to the church about these things that I have been talking about and many others that we consider to be sacred. But here's what Peter warns. He says, 3 and 4, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers are going to come, scoffing, and following their own evil desires. Here's what they're going to say. Where is this coming he promised? They're mocking him. This day of, of judgment on the world that the book of Revelation talks about, this day of accountability where, and judgment by God, ending up in, these, in the events that are going to occur, they're going to come mocking. It's so interesting to me that in Daniel chapter 10, when this revelation, this message was coming to Daniel, there was battle in the heavenlies. They didn't want it to come. And now that it's here, there's a battle over it as well. But ever since, here's what they're going to say. Where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Nothing has ever changed. It all began 15 billion years ago with a bang somewhere. And just has gradually gone. All the processes have always been gradual and the same. Peter says, don't, 
They deliberately forget, look at verse 5, they deliberately forget that long ago, God's, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. How, was, how did the earth and the universe come into existence? By the spoken word of God out of nothing. They deliberately forget that, don't want to think about it. And verse 6, by these waters also, the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. They don't want to think about the global flood either. No, not everything has always been the same, gradually going on. God created things by his spoken word, out of nothing. Later on, he brought a global deluge that destroyed this world. And then Peter goes on to say, and by that same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you. He doesn't want anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will eventually come, and it's going to come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? That's a good question for me and for you. Amen? What kind of people ought you to be? When I believe we're living at the very threshold of these events, we see it before our eyes shaping up. Well, let me share three things that I think come out of this by way of application. Number one, knowing that God's judgment is coming and coming soon, you should put your trust in Christ alone to save you. What are you trusting in? What do you think is going to give, make, make you get into heaven and to be right with God? You're depending on the church. You're depending on yourself, your good works, being a good person. There are no good people in the ultimate sense. The Bible says all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We can't go to heaven. We need to be saved. And God so love the world that he gave his son to become the payment for our sin. He died on the cross, he rose again. And knowing that God's judgment is coming, you should put your trust in Christ alone to save you. That is your rescue. That is what God is calling you to do, to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be born again. If you believe, God will save you. Here's another one. Knowing that God's judgment is coming, we should diligently spread the good news about Christ. We just heard 2.9 billion, but there's people around us <coughs> that don't know the Lord either. People God has put in our paths, and we need to spread the good news about Christ. And then thirdly, realizing that the time of the end is approaching, we should consistently strive to live godly, Christ-centered, focused lives. Serving our Lord, what kind of people ought you to be? And that means serious about our Christian commitment and our relationship to the Lord and serving him and bringing honor to him. Our Father, I want to thank you for this time we can spend in the word. And now as we sing to draw this aspect of the morning to a close, looking forward to the next hour, we ask your greatest blessing. Help us to sing well with all of our heart and to believe these things that you have told us in your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand together at the end of the book of Revelation, the very end of Scripture. He who testifies to these things says, I am coming quickly. And the response to that is, even so, Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all.
All of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is calling soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shout out your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her room, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus, So come, Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice, all will be new. Your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride. church ready for you every heart longing for our king we sing even so come lord jesus come even so come lord jesus come so we wait we wait coming soon so we wait we wait for you God we wait you're coming soon like a bride waiting for her groom we'll be a church Amen. 11.05.